And um, uh, Sierra, would you come up here with me? Just stand right next to me. How many of you know Sierra is one of those you hear before you see? All right. And uh, she is an awesome young lady. Yesterday was her 16th birthday. And uh, she was out here with us going out into the community. And she was my partner. And we had a lot of fun together. And uh, something happened yesterday. We just took bags of candy and we just gave them out in area businesses, just blessing people. If you were a part of that yesterday, would you just hold your hand up? All those that were here, would you give these a great big hand? They helped us yesterday to go out and visit uh, about, a, about 100 different businesses yesterday in that area uh, yesterday. And uh, one of those was the uh, Great Clips Hair Salon right down here by Chick-fil-A. How many know they're going to serve Chick-fil-A in heaven? Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. And so we, uh, Brother Broadus, we went down to uh, the, the Great Clips, a uh, little hair salon, walked in with a gift and just said, hey, we just want to say thank you for what you're doing in our community. Thank you for the services you offer. Thank you for what you do for the economy. Thank you for the people you employ. And about that time, this has never happened to me, and we do this every week somewhere in America. And a young lady grabbed across the uh, the counter to me, and she said, God sent you in here. I need you to pray for me right now. Pray right now. She said, you don't know what, but I need you to pray. And so I was like, well, Lord, uh, help me to know what to say. And so we just stopped, and we prayed right there. And uh, the Lord just gave me a word for her, just a, a word of encouragement. And she looked at me with tears in her eyes, and she said, that's exactly what I needed God to say to me. Now I know what to do. Come on, isn't that awesome? Right there in the Great Clips hair salon. And then right after that, another young lady came up who works there, one of the other employees. She was cutting somebody's hair, put her scissors down, and she came over and said, I need to know Jesus. Can you tell me how to know Jesus? And I need to give my life to Jesus. And so we prayed with her right there. And there were about 15 people getting their hair cut and about 10 people waiting to get their hair cut. And it was amazing. When I stopped to pray, I looked around, and every person bowed their head in that place. And they all prayed with us as we were praying uh, for this young lady to know Christ. Then the other seven employees came to the counter and said, pray for us too. And it was like a church service. I couldn't believe it. In the Great Clips hair salon that all of these people, and then everybody got up and started shaking our hand and said, thank you for, for doing this. We need this in our community. And I want you to know that, is that what God did yesterday? And, and, and so many people uh, that we got to pray with yesterday, how did it make you feel? Because you're 16 years old, and she's got a really big mouth. <laughs> uh, she, but, but it's a big mouth for the Lord. Amen? And, uh, but, but tell them how it made you feel when you got to pray with them. It made me feel great to see that people were willing to hear what we had to say, willing to hear about our, our God, right, just... In the hair salon, let, okay, preach to me now. Tell me about Jesus now. It felt yeah. awesome. Did anybody threaten your life? No. Anybody try to hurt you? No. But do you feel like God used you? Yes. Would y'all give her a great, great, great big hand? Amen. <laughs> Amen. It was awesome. And we got to go out and hand out all of these bags and encourage people to come. And maybe you're here, and I have some friends that are here. Would you guys hold your hand up? We met them at, uh, at Walmart yesterday, and they're here with us today. Would y'all give them a great big hand? So glad you're here with us. And so... We were just out in the community just loving people. You know, I believe this with all my heart, that if, that, that if Jesus was here on the earth today, he wouldn't be in church. I believe he'd be in the community doing everything he could to convince people that they need his love and his grace and his forgiveness. Yes, the, the power of a second chance. Boy, I got a second chance. And, and I know what that means. And so I wanted to just share with you what we're doing and, and how we're doing this every week for different churches all across Alabama. I'll be in uh, Akron, Ohio uh, next week. The week after that, I'll be in Tampa, Florida. And then we'll be back in Birmingham uh, three weeks from now. So we do this in different churches every week. And the only way we can do that is through the help of God's people. And uh, pastor wanted me to just share what we're doing. And we go to a lot of small churches Uh, There was a church in Dothan that just a few weeks ago we started working with. And uh, it had six people, six, in a building this size. There were six people in that sanctuary. The pastor was a brand new pastor. He called me. He said, would you come help us reach our community? And we started working with him about six or seven months ago. And he called me last week, and they had over 60 for Easter last Sunday. Isn't that awesome? From six to 60 just last week. So, I'm going to ask for your help today. I'm going to ask you if, if you be, if a missionary was up here today, they would be asking you to help them get overseas. Is that right? If, 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 so we're a missionary to America. And these small churches cannot afford to bring us in. The only way that we can go to these small churches is when great churches help us to go there. 
And uh, it takes us uh, thousands of dollars every week just to function our ministry with our office, with the people that work with us. And the only way we can do that is with your help. I'm going to ask you to get your checkbook out or your wallet out or your neighbor's checkbook or your neighbor's wallet and just give like you always wanted to, all right? And, and I'm going to ask you to pray. And, Pastor, would you come? And, and if you feel like uh, that this is something that you can sow into, we work very, very hard to do what God's called us to do. I'm not a lazy person. My daddy taught me how to work. And so we work very hard to do what God's called us to do. And we've been out knocking on doors and calling people. And maybe you got a phone call from me yesterday. If you did, I'm glad you're here. And, but we, we want to help the church. And that's what an evangelist needs to do is not just come and preach, but help gather and bring people to the house of God. Do you believe that? Amen. So I am honored to be here with you. And thank you, Pastor, for Praise asking God. me to share that for just you a minute. Just hang on to that. Amen. I want our ushers to come this morning. And uh, listen, if you're new here, we're not asking you for anything. I just want you to know that. Because we went out in this community to, yesterday to do one thing, and that's demonstrate the love and the truth of God. And we're not doing it to get an offering. We did it because Jesus died to get that message to you. And so if you're, you're new here today, you know, please, you're under no obligation to do anything today. And so we just want you to receive the love of God. For those of you that are home folks and, and you believe in what we're trying to do for this community, then, you know, just mark on your tithing envelope or your check. Just put JJ for Johnny Jernigan. Just put JJ on there, okay? If it's cash, put it in an envelope, put JJ on it. If it's a check, write JJ down in the line. He'll get every bit of what you give to him today. For home folks, listen, be faithful in your tithes and your missions commitments. Because, listen... Time is short. People are hurting. People are hurting. Amen? Anybody know any hurting people? Raise your hand. You know hurting people? Listen, we're looking for ways to reach out to them where they're at. And I want to be a part of that. And so I challenge you. Just ask the Holy Spirit what He wants you to do. Okay? Amen? Praise God. Father, in Jesus' name, we ask you, take what we put in your, back in your care and control today, the things you've blessed us with, and we pray that people would encounter the reality of your love, power, grace, forgiveness, healing, and restoration because we gave and helped facilitate the spreading of this word in Jesus' name. Amen. When we took over the church, I was informed by the pastor who left when he was transferring things to me, and my mother-in-law voted at the time to close the church. There had been a lot of problems. It was down to just a small handful of people. There was less than $3 in the checking account, and just the last thing he told me as a little blessing, I guess, for me was, one of the ushers is robbing from the offering. Uh, that was his parting shot. I was like, what? He said, yeah, because the tithing envelopes add up to more money than it's actually in the offering. And there were only three ushers. <laughs> but I didn't know who. It was so hard that the first Sunday that I was there, there were two services at that time. We used to go much later than we do now, 11 o'clock in the morning, 7.30 at night. When I stood up to speak in the 7.30 service, probably no one in this building except for my wife was there, maybe Chrissy. It was so hard. There was such a darkness. Satan was making some move to destroy this church. Inexperienced pastor, young, that I stood up I can't tell you what I was supposed to preach about, but it wasn't a good sermon, I can tell you that now. And I started to speak, and a choking came in my throat. And I felt like someone was stifling me to speak. I looked out at the audience, the handful of people that were there, and although they were there, all I could feel was a dark curtain in the spirit realm, that's all I could feel. I maybe did three minutes of some kind of jabbering, and then I just stopped and I said, 
I can't preach here. Something's wrong here. I don't know much. I'm new to all of this, but something's wrong. We really need God. That's the truth. That was my sermon. I broke down and wept and said, we really need God. I called the people forward to pray. As we prayed and prayed, because I didn't preach, as we prayed and prayed, the Holy Spirit came in some palpable way. And I was just praying, God, what are, what are we gonna do? There can't be a church here. This is some kind of den of iniquity or something. And as we were praying and praying and praying and pressing in and praying, a young man ran to the front and threw himself at the altar. And it was the usher who was robbing all the money. I never said anything. I'd be embarrassed to say that in a meeting. How could you say that? You'd lose the confidence of all the people. He grabbed me, whispered it in my ear. I said, okay. Just don't usher anymore, you know, in <laughs> case you backslide. <laughs> And then for the first months, that happened a lot. Not just because I couldn't preach very good, I couldn't. Don't do so good now. But I just would call the people to pray. Why? Because when Satan is fighting against you, certain things don't turn around with 30 second prayers or 60-second prayers, or claiming a promise. Now, that, that happens at times. But you have to discern prayer. You have to understand what's happening around you. There's no formula to prayer. Jesus gave us the Lord's Prayer, which is really the disciples' prayer, as a model prayer. But we know from the Bible that other kinds of prayers were offered. And tonight, what I want to do is go back even though there's a lot more people and we're to the top of the balcony here with all of you, I want to go back and challenge us to go back to the kind of praying we need to go back to if we're going to see God change people's lives, New York City, America, the world. How many want to see God come and do just something amazing? Chicago, we have people here from Pennsylvania and Iowa. Look, look, if it would just happen by preaching and handing out Bibles, it would have happened by now. It would have happened by now. If it would just happen by PowerPoints and slickness and smoke coming up while the praise and worship is going on, it would have happened by now. So there's an element missing, and that's the element of God coming in answer to desperate, prevailing prayer. Amen. I played all that. I know it's not moving. It will be a, a video Wednesday night. But I found this on the internet, and I wanted you to hear the testimony of the man that's going to be featured on these videos. God has moved in an amazing way in Brooklyn Tabernacle, in Brooklyn, New York. And uh, I believe he's got something to share with our congregation. And we will talk, we'll, we'll discuss it, about 10, 15 minute videos, and then we'll discuss it. And we will practice what we're learning, which is prayer. Amen. Listen, Brother Johnny is going to come and he's going to share God's word with you this morning. And I know he'll say more about this, but tonight we have a drama. And I, I just implore you, come and bring somebody with you. They're going to be impacted in a powerful way. Bring those that need to know God has something for them. Bring those people with you. Brother Johnny, come on. Hallelujah. Let's all stand together, can we? Hallelujah. I am standing even though it doesn't look like it. All right? Let's all stand together, can we? Amen. Can you join hands with somebody next to you? Listen, we're about to read God's Word. And, and when we read God's Word, something supernatural can happen. So here's what I'm going to ask you to agree with me for right now. And I want you to prepare your heart. Listen, today could be the day that heaven says yes over you. Now, that was pretty weak. I said today could be the day that heaven says yes over you. And I don't know about you, but I'm desperate for something that what we just heard about in prayer, I'm desperate for this right here in this place. So I want us to pray for two things. First of all, let's pray for God's anointing. Everyone say God's anointing. 
The Bible says it's the anointing that breaks the yoke. It's not good preaching. It's not good music. It's his power that breaks the anointing. So I need you to agree. And here's the rules while I'm preaching today, all right, from the balcony on the floor. As I'm preaching, if I say something that sounds good, you say, amen, hallelujah, that was good. If I say something you don't like, you say, amen, hallelujah, that was good, all right? So you agree with me, all right? Help me preach and, and help me do this today. I don't want to, we're here to do this together. So we need his anointing, amen? Second thing I want us to pray for is an open heart. Everybody say an open heart. Listen, I don't know everything, but neither do you. And if you think you do, you might as well slip out right now because there's not much we can offer you today. But if you'll open your heart, today could be the day that heaven says yes over the circumstances surrounding you. And God can do something supernatural. If you're comfortable with it, would you lift that person's hand to heaven and would you pray with me? Father, thank you for every man, every woman, every boy, every girl that's here. And Lord, we're not here to watch a video. We're not here to see a man. We're not to hear a man. We're here to meet with you and for you to meet with us. And Lord, we believe with the vision that you've given our pastor... That, Lord, that this is the beginning of the greatest season in the history of this church. And that, Lord, that you're unleashing something in this hour to give us the harvest. So, Lord, give us ears to hear and eyes to see what you want to say today. Let your anointing come on every man, every woman, every boy, every girl, wherever they might be watching this somewhere else. And, Lord, we believe for the power of God to touch every person so that we'll never be the same. We'll be changed when we leave this place today in Jesus' name. Come on, pray for the hands you're holding. You don't know what they're going through, but God does. Come on, pray for them. Lord, we pray one for another that not one person will leave this place the same way they came in, but they'll leave built up and edified and strengthened and better than they were when they came in. And we believe you now for miracles, signs, and wonders in this place today in Jesus' name. And if you agree, everybody say amen. Before you're seated, would you look at the person next to you right in the eyes and say, man, you look good today. Would you tell them today? (laughs) Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. (laughs) Hallelujah. We're so glad you're here. It's an honor to be here with you. Open your Bible, if you would, with me to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 4, and beginning in verse 15, Luke chapter 4, and beginning in verse 15, we'll look at God's Word there together. And uh, let me, while you're turning in your Bible or your device, let me invite you to be back tonight. We are doing this drama tonight. We do it somewhere every Sunday night. And it's incredible what God is doing through this simple drama. It's only about an hour in length. And um, Emma is going to be a part. Is Emma in here or is she in another part of the building? Emma's going to be a part of our dialogue. Pastor will be a part of our dialogue. Uh, and then uh, Cameron is going to be. Is Cameron in here? They'll be a part of our dialogue. And then I'll be doing a part. And uh, a lot of media. We're giving away a bunch of prizes. It's going to be a lot of fun. But it's a power. Powerful, powerful message that transforms the heart. And so we need you to get someone here. Uh, Invite someone, a neighbor, a classmate. We have tickets outside, and we're going to ask you to get one of those tickets. Give it to someone at lunch today. There's nothing better going on in Gunnersville tonight than the drama that will be here. And I know that a lot of you are already not planning on coming back tonight. I'm going to beg you, please rearrange your schedule Please come and join us and hear this message of hope and this message of love. And we would love, love, love for you to be a part of this, okay? And so um, how many of you have a friend that's not a Christian? Hold your hand up. Think of them right now. Think of their name. Lord, I pray for every hand that just went up that, Lord, you'll help us to go tell them. America's in trouble. Our nation is in trouble. And, Lord, we need your help right now more than we have ever needed your help. We need your divine intervention. And, Lord, drugs and perversions are destroying our culture, politics, and the ways of this world. And we're asking, oh, God, that you would help us to do our part. Lord, a farmer can never expect a harvest until he first puts the seed in the ground. So, Lord, use these tickets. Use it to help us to find someone. that This could be the eternal thing that could change their soul. So help us to go get them, invite them, and say there's a drama at our church. And we'll get them here tonight, and we'll believe for your touch and your help over their life tonight in Jesus' name. And if you believe with me, everybody say amen. Listen, I don't know about you, but I I understand this. Fish don't jump in boats. And if we want to catch fish, we got to go do our part. And nothing times nothing is Nothing. And sometimes people will come to a drama when they'll never come to hear a sermon. 
And so they want to see something that's entertaining. This will be very entertaining. It will be very encouraging tonight for every person who comes. And, Pastor, thank you again for letting us do this. And thank you for giving into our ministry. I didn't want to give you a number a while ago. We're trying to raise $10,000 right now just to buy some equipment that we so desperately need to upgrade because we have churches everywhere waiting for help. So would you pray with us? And thank you for sharing in that offering with us. A little rabbit hopped in a paint store one day, and he asked the owner of the paint store, he said, do you have any carrots here? And the owner of the paint store said, well, I'm sorry, little buddy. We don't have any carrots here. We only sell paint here. And if you want carrots, you'll have to go somewhere else. And the little rabbit hopped out of the paint store. Next day, little rabbit hopped back in the paint store. And he asked the owner of the paint store, he said, do you have any carrots here? And the owner of the paint store said, well, I'm sorry, little buddy. I told you yesterday, uh, we only sell paint here. If you want carrots, you'll have to go somewhere else. I apologize. We don't have any, any carrots in this place. Little rabbit hopped out of the paint store. Next day, little rabbit hopped back in the paint store. And he asked the owner of the paint store, he said, do you have any carrots here? And the owner of the paint store became a little frustrated. He said, look, buddy, I told you twice now, we only sell paint here. If you want carrots, you'll have to go somewhere else. And if you come back in here again looking for carrots, I'm going to nail you to the wall by your ears. Little rabbit hopped out of the paint store. Next day, little rabbit hopped back in the paint store. And he asked the owner of the paint store, he said, do you have any nails? And he said, no. He said, good. Do you have any carrots? All right. Now, that's a spirit that just says, I'm not going to give up. Would you say that with me? I'm not going to give up. Will you say it really loud? I'm not going to give up. Jesus was really addressing something in this particular parable that we're going to look at today that I believe he was asking us not to give up on our culture, not to give up on our family, not to give up on our friends, not to give up on revival, not to give up on these things. And if you don't know what a parable is, a parable is a short story. Jesus was an illustrator. He, he told stories so that people could look maybe what the kingdom of God would look like when Jesus returns. Don't be fooled. Jesus is coming back. The Bible says that a thousand years is as a day and a day is as a thousand years in, in other words really Jesus has only been gone for three days and he told us that at a time when you think not like a distant thunder like a thief in the night so shall the coming of the son of man be see we don't hear many messages on the second coming of Jesus anymore but I want you to know that doesn't diminish the fact that Jesus is returning but he's turn, returning for a church that has oil in their lamps he's returning for a church that is prepared for his coming He's returning for a church that is looking for him to come. Is that right? Yes or no? And so I want to look at this particular parable today. And Jesus was addressing something that he really wanted them to understand. This is in red letters in my Bible. And when it's in red letters, who do we believe said it? We don't believe these are the words of Billy Graham. We don't believe these are the words of Johnny Jernigan or Gary Kraft. We believe these are the words of Jesus, our Savior. And Jesus made a statement in this particular story that he was trying to paint a picture of what the end of time would look like and what our responsibility should be in that. If you like a title for a sermon, it's on the screen. The title for this today is No More Excuses. Would you say that with me? No more excuses. Can you say it really loud? No more excuses. Hit the person next to you and say, get ready. All right, would you tell them? I want you to read this with me. It'll be on the screen. I'm reading from the New International Version. If it's different from yours, would you read along with me? It says this. In Luke chapter 14, I'm going to wait for him to put it on the screen. Can we read this together? Read along with me. It says this. When one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, Blessed is the one who will eat of the feast in the kingdom of God. And Jesus replied, A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I have just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. No explanation needed. Verse 21. The servant came back and reported this to his master, and then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you have ordered has been done. But there is still room. Would you read verse 23 out loud with me? Would you read it out loud? Then the master told his servant, Go out to the roads and country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. And verse 24 says, And I tell you, not one of those who are invited will get a taste of my banquet. 
in this particular story, Jesus is painting a picture of what the end of time is going to look like and what he expects for those who have been invited. The Bible says there was a great banquet and everyone was invited. But there were excuses that got in the way of those people of coming to that great banquet. They were much more interested in staying home with their cattle. They were much more interested in looking at their new property. And they were much more interested in staying home with their spouse than they were than going to the house of God. Sounds a little like America, doesn't it? Mm, I want, it sounds a lot like our culture and where we are as a nation. And so Jesus says the banquet is prepared, everything is now ready. And it was a picture that Jesus was saying, I am about to pay for the sins of the world. Everything is prepared. Invite everyone to come and dine to feast at the master's table. But the Bible says they had excuses. I'm saying today, may we declare when we leave this place, no more excuses. Would you say it with me? No more excuses. How many of you have ever had somebody give you an excuse before and you knew they were giving you an excuse? Would you hold your hand up so I can see it? Okay, how many of you have ever given someone an excuse before and you knew you were giving them an excuse? Hold your hand up. All right. What I'm about to tell you is a true story. Uh, when I was a sophomore in high school, uh, we were getting ready for our big homecoming football game. And how many of you know the homecoming football game is the, the, the most exciting game the whole football season? Because the girls were those big, pregnant, ugly flowers. And the guys get all dressed up because they want to be a part of this great banquet. And they're always looking for that special date to take to the homecoming game. Is that right? Does anybody else remember that but me? All right. And, and so I remember my homecoming game. I was a sophomore in high school. And there was a young lady who was a freshman. Her name was Lynn Bethay. And she was so beautiful that when she would walk by me, it just hurt. <laughs> I mean, it was, just, it was just hard to even look at her. She was so beautiful. And my heart would just beat out of my chest when she would walk by. She was just so beautiful. And I wanted to escort her for our homecoming football game. So I started hanging around her. I carried her books to class for her. I sat with her in the cafeteria. I wrote her letters. I called her on the phone. I went by her house. I sent her flowers. And finally the big day came when Lynn looked at me and she said, Johnny, would you please escort me across the field for our homecoming football game? And I said, yes, I'd love to. Because it was the first chance that I'd ever had to wear my three-piece blue corduroy suit. And it was the original bell bottoms. Anybody remember bell bottoms? You know, it took five minutes for the back, you know, to catch up with the front with every step that you took, all right? And, and, and bell bottoms are even coming back in style right now, all right? And, and so I had my bell bottoms, I had my three-piece blue corduroy suit, she had her big flower on, and they, there were about 10,000 people at Ladd Memorial Stadium in Mobile, Alabama, and I'll never forget this night. They called out freshman first, and her name started with a B, Bethay, but it's almost like they said my name louder than anybody else's that night. It was almost like they said, Lynn Bethay, escorted by Johnny Jernigan in his three-piece blue corduroy suit. So I escort her across the field, and we're having just a great time. And after our, our football game, we went to our gymnasium for our homecoming dance. And it was awesome. My arms were around her, and her arms were around me. And we were swaying to the music. Can everybody sway with me just a little bit? Come on, can you just sway just a little bit? And we're swaying to the music. And then all of a sudden, with a quiver in her voice, she whispered to me. She said, Johnny, i, I got to tell you something. And I said, well, what is it, Lynn? And I expected her to say something really nice. She said, well, i got to tell you that. Well, i got to tell you that I can't go out with you anymore. I said, what do you mean, woman? You can't go out with me anymore. You got on your flower. I got on my suit. We're here in the gymnasium. And she said, well, the reason I can't go out with you is because... Well, the reason I can't go out with you is because I'm dying. I said, what? She said, yes, I've got this thing growing on my brain. The doctors have only given me three months to live. I can't see you anymore. I can't talk to you anymore. I can't go out with you anymore. And mascara running down her face. And she took off running to the end of the gymnasium with all of her friends. And I'm in a panic because you just don't hear that while you're in the gymnasium dancing with someone. And so I chase her to the end of the gymnasium. I said, Lynn, what are you talking about? She said, no, I can't go out with you anymore. I can't see you anymore. I can't talk, talk to you anymore. I only have three months to live. The doctor said, I've got this thing growing on my brain. It could explode at any moment. I can't see you anymore. For the next three months, I wrote her letters, and she never returned my letters. For the next three months, I called her on the phone, and she wouldn't come to the phone. For the next three months, I went to her house, and she wouldn't come to the door. And after six months, I noticed Lynn was still looking very, very healthy. 
And then I found out she was building a heavy-duty industrial strength relationship with one of the star football players on our football team. She dumped me with the excuse she was dying. <laughs> Ladies, that's just a little bit drastic. All right? I mean, all she had to do was say, eat dirt and die. I would have left her alone. But no, the heifer told me she was dying. Now, I'm going to tell you, that is the worst excuse I have ever heard in my life. And this was, this was about 33 years ago now, and I still see her in Mobile sometimes. And whenever I see her, I say, hey, Lynn, how do you feel today? <laughs> and Pastor, I'm really glad I never married her. She's ugly as a mud fence. I'm going to tell you the truth. The years have not been kind. Now, that is a very, very true story that happened to me when I was in high school. That's the worst excuse I have ever heard in my life. In this parable, Jesus comes to them and he says, The kingdom of God is ready. Everything is prepared. Come and dine. But the Bible says that they all made excuses. And the Bible says in this passage, the short little phrases, but it says it was a great banquet. Would you say that with me? It was a great banquet. Now, if the Bible says it was a great banquet, how many believe it was a great banquet? And I wasn't there, but I have a vivid imagination. I'm sure there were 45-pound butterball turkeys, corn on the cob, black-eyed peas, fried okra, cranberry sauce, but you don't have to eat that, pecan pie, apple pie, Coke and bread and tea. And there's this, all this wonderful, wonderful food. So the, he, Jesus gives an instruction to the servant, go tell them it's time to come and eat. They get to feast with the king. The table is prepared. Let me, let me say it like this. If the Queen of England, if Queen Elizabeth sent you round-trip tickets for you and your family to come to Buckingham Palace and spend a week in London, England, and, and to sit and talk with her at her table, how many believe you would take those tickets and you would go to London, England? Now, if you didn't raise your hand, you're telling a fib, all right? If the Queen of England it was sent a letter and they said, we're giving you first-round tickets to London, England, first class, all the way to London, England, you get to feast with the Queen of England. It's prepared. You get to spend several days just sitting and talking with Queen Elizabeth. How many of you think you'd do that? Can I tell you that Jesus was saying in this particular parable, he was saying everyone gets to feast not with a mere queen, but with the king of the universe. They get to feast with the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So the servant, the implication is goes to the first person and says, Come on, 45-pound butterball turkey, corn in the cob, black-eyed peas, fried okra, cranberry sauce, but you don't have to eat that, pecan pie, apple pie, Coke, and bread and tea. And the first person said, Well, I just bought a field, and i got to go and see it. Please excuse me. I'm not going to be able to make it. Now, how many of you would buy a piece of property you've never seen before? Don't, don't raise your hand if you would. That is serious Dane Bramage, serious Dane Bramage, and not a quality choice in buying a piece of property. So the servant, it implies, goes to the second person. Hey, everything's ready. The banquet's come and feast with the king. There's a 45-pound butterball turkey, corn on the cob, black-eyed peas, fried okra, cranberry sauce, but you don't have to eat that, pecan pie, apple pie, Coke, and bread and tea. And the second person said, well, I'd like to come to the banquet, but, but, but I just bought five cows, and i got to go and try them out. Please excuse me. Now, how many of you would buy a car you've never driven before? Don't raise your hand if you would. That is not a smart choice. That is serious Dane Bramage and not a quality choice in buying a vehicle. So the servant goes, the implication is to the third person and says, Hey, come on, 45-pound butterball turkey, corn of the cob, black-eyed peas, fried okra, cranberry sauce. Does anybody here like cranberry sauce? Uh, I, 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 and you don't have to eat that. Pecan pie, apple pie, Coke, and bread and tea. They got all this wonderful food. And the third person said, Well, I just got married. And my wife's making me clean the house, build an addition to the house. And she's got me right there doing what a married woman does to a married man. And he has to do all those things. And every married man in the room says, there's a few brave ones. All right, there's a few brave ones. That, and so he didn't make it. His excuse was he had just gotten married. Now look at me. Every eyeball right here in the balcony, watch this. The Bible tells us they had a chance to feast with the king. But they were much more interested in staying home with their property they were much more interested in going and checking out their cattle, and they were much more interested in staying home with their spouse than they were with feasting in the house of God. I want you to understand there are three mistakes that they made in this parable that we're continuing to make as a culture here in America. That if we're going to see what we talked about in that prayer dialogue just a moment ago, if we're going to see the vision that God has given this pastor fulfilled, We've got to throw something off of us. We've got to throw a chain off of us that I'm not going to allow any excuse to stop me from feasting with him. 
Oh, that was pretty weak. I said, we're not going to let anything stop us from feasting with him. Yes? The three mistakes they made. Number one, they all had excuses. Number two, the Bible tells us they had, it seems that they had empty expectations. And the third mistake that they made was that they became the wrong example. The wrong example. The Bible tells us they had excuses, they had empty expectations, and that they became the wrong example. Let me show you this. The Bible says they all had excuses. Do you know that the enemy will use every silly, dumb, stupid, ridiculous excuse to stop you from believing that God can do something great with you? The devil is very, very good at bringing up our past. The devil is very, very good at reminding us of mistakes that we've made. There's not one of us sitting in this room in the balcony or on the floor that wishes we couldn't go back and change some things that we did in previous days. Yes, there's not one of us that we wish we could go back and change that. The fact is, we can never go back and change something that we've done. The only thing that we can do is start right now and change the way we live from here. And the enemy, the Bible says, is the father of Lies. Somebody said, how do you know if the devil's lying? If his lips are moving, he's lying. He cannot tell the truth. And he'll constantly remind us of what our family was like. He'll constantly remind us of what we did in previous years. He'll constantly remind us of our mistakes. And I learned a long time ago when it was Jim Cimbala, who you saw in that video just a moment ago, who taught me, Pastor Gary, when the devil brings up your past, bring up his future. Because I know my past and I know the mistakes that I've made that I wish that I could go back and change those things. But devil, I want you to understand this. I know what my future is too. And I've got a future in eternity with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and God has forgiven me and he's given me a new chance and I've started over. But if you bring up my past one more time, I'm going to bring up your future. And devil, you've got a lake of fire in front of you and judgment forever. So stop bringing up my past or I'm going to bring up your future. Yes? God doesn't want you living in your mistakes of yesterday. God doesn't want you to let those excuses. Well, God, I'd love to serve you, but don't you remember what I used to be like? God, I'd love to serve you, but don't you remember the mistakes that I made? God, I would love to to serve you, but don't you know what my, my ex was like and what my life was like in that previous marriage? God, I'd love to serve you, but don't you remember what I did when nobody else was watching? And he's very, very good at bringing up our past and whispering about the mistakes that we've made in yesteryears. When I was a sophomore in high school uh, and and, and a junior and and a senior, uh, I set a state, uh, 6A state of Alabama baseball record uh, my senior year. I loved to play baseball, and I hit 18 home runs my senior year. It It was a state record for just one year. The next year, somebody broke it. They hit 19. But I got to set that record for one year at Shaw High School in Mobile. I hit 18 home runs. My mother never came to watch any of my baseball games. She never came to one of them. And you know what I could have done as a younger man in my late teens, in my early 20s and 30s and 40s? I could have said, the reason I act the way I act is because of what my mama did. The reason I act the way I act and the way I am the way I am is because my mama never came to watch me play any of my baseball games. And she so scarred me because my mama never came to watch me play baseball. And I could blame every mistake that I've made on my mother never coming to watch me play baseball. The fact is, my mother just hates baseball. My daddy saw every one of my home runs. My daddy was at every game I went to. And I love my mother today, and I honor her still today. The fact is, I can't blame my mother for what I did in my 20s or my 30s or my 40s or now in my 50s. We're not going to have the privilege of blaming a teacher or an ex-husband or an ex-wife or a pastor or a policeman or anybody else. We're going to have to take responsibility for the things that we do with our life. Yes? Everybody smile and say, I love the little preacher. I think he's a sweet little man. We can't blame it on anybody else. Listen, the enemy loves to bring up our family. Listen, you want to talk about dysfunction? My family tree looks like a weed. You want to talk about, I am the first Jernigan male to make it into my 50s without being an alcoholic. I am, listen, I am the, in my family tree, I am the first Jernigan male to still be married to the same woman that I married as a young man. God broke that curse off of me. And now my children don't have to deal with alcohol. My children don't have to deal with divorce because God broke that curse in me. And I can blame everything else in my life. But I want you to know, my family's got a lot of dysfunction. My family's got a lot of issues. But I can't blame them for what happens with me. Yes? 
We can't let excuses. Well, and, and here's where the American church loves to live today. Well, God, I'll only do that every once in a while because God is a forgiving God, and he'll forgive me if I make a mistake. That is a very sloppy way at looking at the grace of God. And I want you to understand God is a forgiving God. Well, I'll only watch it every once in a while. Well, I'll only drink it every once in a while. I'll, I'll only go do that every once in a while. I'll keep it under control. And we'll make excuses for it saying that that's okay. And we accept that into our house. Let me ask you this. Would you allow sewage from the city of Gunnersville to be poured into your living room for, for 10 minutes? Would you allow it for 30 minutes? Would you allow it for one minute? And yet, what I was making mistakes for just several years ago, I walked into my house, and there was a, a cable television show coming into my house called Glee. It was a show, uh, 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 and it was a musical called Glee. And, and there were two boys kissing on the television, and I had to make a choice right now as my teenage children were watching this. And I went over, and I unplugged the television. I pulled the cable out of the wall, and I called the cable company, and I said, cancel this. This is not going to come into my house anymore, that I don't want my children watching this. And we got Netflix. We don't even have television in our house anymore. We got rid of our cable, and now we can monitor what our children watch. We can monitor what's being watched because I don't want the sewage in my house for 30 minutes, for 10 minutes, or 30 seconds. Come on, somebody. And I can make excuses for it saying, well, I only watch it every once in a while. I only go there every once in a while. I only drink it every once in a while. And that's where the American culture has gotten very, very sloppy, I'm afraid, with God's grace. He is a forgiving God, but don't push him to the limit. Yes. Hallelujah. Excuses. We can all allow excuses that I got to go take care of my property. I got to go take care of my cattle. I don't have time for the house of God because something more important is in, in my life right now than the house of God. Can I tell you with all the love that I have for you today, there is nothing in your life more important than what happens in this house. There is nothing more important than what God can do in your life. And we've just got to make room for him and say, I'm not going to make excuses. No more excuses, God. Can you say that with me? No more excuses, God. Can you say it one more time? No more excuses. We can all justify it. They all justified it. But the Bible says they missed their place at the banquet. The second mistake they made in this parable was what, what I call they had empty expectations. They had empty expectations. They, did, they, just, they just didn't think that this parable was going to be very good. So they obviously said, I can blow that off because I'm going to go watch my cattle. I'm going to go check out my, my property. I'm, I'm going to go hang out with my spouse. And so they just obviously did not have very much expectation for what was going to happen at this banquet. See, the same thing happens in churches all over the country. See, the only difference between you and me today is perspective. I get to see the body of Christ in a lot of different places. You get to see the body of Christ right here at Lake City. So, but I get to see it in a lot of places. And I see this all over the country that we think we got this whole Christian thing figured out. Okay? Can y'all scoot over just a little bit? Can I sit here with you? All right. Okay. All right. And see, we think we got this whole Christian thing figured out. That we know when we come in to the church and the balcony, you can't see me, but you can hear me. We know when we come in the house of God that we're going we're gonna to sing and, 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 what, and the worship was awesome this morning. And then we know we're going to make some announcements. And then we know we're going to take the offering because there's three things you can count on in life. That's life and death and the offering will be taken in church. Hallelujah. And then somebody's going to preach. And then before we leave, we know they're going to ask us to come to the front for prayer. And I watch this all over America. When they ask people to come to the front, they just start dragging up. <laughs> God, it's 11.45 and I'm starving to death, God. Make that little preacher shut up, God. God, how long do we have to stay here? I'm hungry. And then the pastor says, amen, and we jump up and we skip out like we're ready to go do the rest of the activities of that day. And, and we have that look on our face, just like some of you got it on your faces right now. How long do we have to be here, God? How long is this service going to last and you know what? We watch football games for hours. We watch movies for hours. Why? We binge watch 30 episodes on Netflix now for hours. What is wrong with staying in the house of God for hours? But we've, we've bought into an American culture that says you've got a certain amount of time. And revivals used to be revivals. They weren't revivals unless they lasted for two weeks. 
Then it went to four day, a week. Then it went to four days. Then it went to a weekend. Then it went to Saturday and Sunday. Then it went to Sunday. Then it was just Sunday morning and Sunday night. Not just Sunday morning. And you only got an hour and a half. And you better get it all in, boy, because we're ready to get out of here. Everybody say, I love the little preacher. I think he's a sweet little man. See, what are you expecting? President James Hennessy, who was my uh, Bible college president, said this. He said, miracles never happen where they are not anticipated or expected. Miracles rarely happen where they are not anticipated or they expect. See, what are you expecting today? I was in a Benny Hinn crusade several years ago. How many of you know who Benny Hinn is? If you don't know who he is, it's okay. Benny Hinn used to do great healing crusades all across America. And regardless of what you think of Benny Hinn, let me tell my story. Um, he, don't, he no longer does those crusades anymore, and it's for a good reason. And if you'd like to know why, I'll tell you after the service. But Benny Hinn was in Mobile. Uh, he, he, he came to do a great crusade at our civic center. And I'll never forget my wife and I going there, and we were sitting in the minister's section. And there was about a 300-voice choir up on the platform, as he had, and they were singing those beautiful hymns, and, and it was just powerful. There were about 10,000 people in the arena. And, and, and uh, I'll never forget what this woman and her son said in front of us. The, the woman in front of, sitting on the chairs in front of us in the minister's section was from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And her son had cystic fibrosis. He had a breathing mask on. And you could literally hear every breath this boy took just. <sighs> and we could hear him. And the mother put her arm around Benny Hinn, uh, uh, around the little boy's shoulder. She put her arm right around him and she said, son, we've driven three and a half hours for a miracle. And we're not leaving without a miracle. Benny Hinn wasn't even on the platform. All of a sudden, as they, st they were still singing, the next voice you heard in a few moments was Benny Hens. And he stepped out on the platform, and he said, the Lord is present to heal. And he started calling out diseases. And people started running to the front. And this, it, then he called out cystic fibrosis. And I'll never forget this as long as I live. The little boy re re pulled his mask off his face. He said, Mama, I think it's me. I think it's me, Mama. I feel something on the inside. And he took off running in front of 10,000 people. His mama took off running right behind him. And I took off running right behind her. I wanted to see what God was going to do. And Benny Hinn called that boy up on the platform. And he said, what's God doing for you? He said, I feel something in my chest. He said, I can breathe. For the first time, I can breathe, Brother Benny. And then Benny Hinn laid his hand on him, and the boy fell in what we call under the power of God. And I said, God, are you really healing this boy, or is this just some Pentecostal thing that evangelists do just to get people excited? So I said, I'm going to follow this boy the rest of that night. And I want you to know, I never let him out of my sight. I watched that boy till he left the arena. And can I tell you, he left that place doing exactly every time Jesus touched somebody. He was dancing and leaping for joy. He left his breathing tank and his breathing mask in the minister section. And he left that place totally healed in that arena that night. Come on, can somebody give the Lord a shout of praise for that, what God did? Can I tell you, I believe it happened if, with very little, if nothing to do with Benny Hinn. I believe that miracle happened because of a mother's expectation that said, if nobody else gets a miracle, if nobody else wants something from heaven, we've come asking for something from heaven that you'll touch us, you'll help us, you'll strengthen us. And can I tell you, the same thing can happen right here at Lake City, that every time we gather, if we're saying, God, I've come not just to hear a sermon, I've not come not just to hear a song, but I've come to meet with you, and we're all drawing on heaven as the man of God is preaching, as the song of the Lord is being sung and something supernatural will happen every time we gather because it's not business as usual but there's an expectation that God we're believing for the power of God to come and touch people in this place let's be honest for just a minute I, I, I need a miracle for something in my life so I'm raising my hand first how many of you need a miracle in your life for something right now hold your hand up there's something you're believing God for something you're believing for heaven hold it up again hold it up real high look around this room just business as usual won't get that done. He said just a 30-second prayer might not get that done, not even a three-minute prayer. It might take that travailing expectation that God were believing that heaven is going to come and touch us. And the same thing can happen here in this room right now as we say, God, we believe, we believe. Come on, say this with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe you're a miracle-working God. I need your miracle, your power, in my life today. I'm expecting your touch in my life today. In Jesus' name. 
The Bible says, ask and it will be. Seek and you will. Knock and the door will be. If we're asking, if we're seeking, if we're knocking, if we're expecting. See, they just didn't expect very much at this banquet. And the Bible tells us that they lost their place at the banquet. They would much rather have stayed with their spouse. And nothing wrong with staying with your spouse. They would much rather check out their property. And nothing wrong with owning property. They would much rather check out their cattle. And nothing wrong with owning cattle. But it can't impede coming to the house of God. And that excuse has got to be broken over this culture. Yes. The third mistake they made in this parable was they, they became the wrong example. Everyone say the wrong example. The Bible tells us that they lost their place at the banquet. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that they lost it for an hour? They lost it for a month? They lost it for a year? How long did they lose it? They lost their place at the, ba- at the banquet forever. See, we're very, very time conscious. As American people, we're very, very time conscious. We think in hours We think in time schedules. And I want you to understand, God doesn't think that way. Time and distance and space mean nothing to Him. He created all of it. But we're very, very time conscious. We're body, soul, and spirit. And our body often overrides our spirit man because we're very, very time conscious. Let me me try to paint a picture for what forever is. Forever is a long time. Forever away from God is even longer. People say, I don't believe in hell. That won't make it go away. I want you to understand the Bible says they lost their place. They were removed from the banquet. Here's a picture of maybe what forever could look like. Maybe forever is like a bird that flies out here to Lake Gunnersville. And he goes out to the shore and he picks up one grain of sand in his beak. And he flies all the way to Los Angeles, California. Would everybody fly with me? Come on, can you do this? And he drops that grain of sand onto the beaches of Los Angeles, California. Then he turns and flies all the way back to Lake Gunnersville here in uh, Gunnersville, Alabama. Can you fly with me again? And he grabs one more grain of sand in his beak. And he turns and flies back to Los Angeles, California. One more last time. Can you fly with me? That's a wounded bird right there. All right. She got him halfway. All right. By the time that bird has removed every grain of sand from Lake Gunnersville onto the shores of Los Angeles, California beaches. One grain of sand at a time. By the time that bird has removed every grain of sand from Lake Gunnersville onto the shores of of the beaches of Los Angeles, California, one grain of sand at a time, that that is the beginning of eternity. Eternity is a long time. Eternity in hell will be longer. So the Bible tells us that the master became angry. He said they have excuses. They're not expecting very much. And they obviously have become the wrong example. Here's what I want. They've lost their place. It says the the master became angry. And they said, what do you want us to do? He said, "Go. I want you to go get the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame and bring them in. And the implication is they brought in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame and set them in there. But there was obviously obviously still room. Just like we got a few chairs that are empty here today, there was obviously a few seats that were still available. And they went to him and they said, Master, what do you want us to do? We've got some empty seats. He said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to the highways and hedges, and I want you to compel them to come in so that the house of God will be full. Everyone say compel. Come on, say it really loud. Compel. The word compel means this. It means do whatever is necessary to get people to the house of God. Do whatever is necessary to influence. Do whatever is necessary to persuade people to be in the house of God. Because he said, I want my house full. Is that what he says? He said, I want my house what? He said, I want my house full. It wasn't an implication that this was for a specific group of people. This is for for all the people, not just preachers, but all the people. I want you to go and compel them, influence them, persuade them that they need to be in the house of God. And I want you to know, you might not know everything there is to preaching a gospel message. You might not know all the theology of God's Word, but every person can do what I'm about to show you. The Bible says go into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in. Will you come help me, young man? And he says go and get them and bring them into the house of God. Would you bend over? And he says go get them and compel them to come in so that the house of God will be full. All right? Would you just stay right there? Okay. And see, you might not know all the theology of God's Word, but he says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go and compel them to come in so that this house will be full. That young man right there, would you help me real quick? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you. Mm -hmm. And would you bend over real quick? Hallelujah. He's a little bigger than I thought he was. Hallelujah. 
And he says, go get them and bring them into the house of God. And we don't have to just go for the smaller ones. We can go for the bigger ones too. Hallelujah. Would you help me? You just walk. Hallelujah. <laughs> I was born at night, but it wasn't last night. Hallelujah. And the Bible says go and get them and compel them to come in so that the house of God will be full. I was in Askewville, North Carolina, right outside the, uh, the Outer Banks up in North Carolina several years ago. And I'll never forget this. And I was preaching, and there was a woman who said, I'm so glad you said drag them to the house of God. She said, my son was a crack addict. Every night passed out from crack cocaine, laying in front of our television unconscious from drugs. And I was sick and tired of what drugs was doing to my son. And she said, I went to church that morning, and my pastor said, God can heal anything. And she said, she came home that afternoon, and her son was passed out in front of the television from crack cocaine. And she said, my pastor said, God can heal anything. So she tied his hands up, she tied his feet up, and she drug her son out to the back seat of her car. She drove to the church. When she got to the church, she came to the side door of the sanctuary and pulled her son, who was about 17 years old, pulled him into the sanctuary and laid him right in front of the pulpit where the pastor was preaching. And the pastor, being a loving pastor, said, what are you doing? She said, you said this morning God can heal anything. And she said, I'm sick of drugs destroying my son, and I don't want it in my house anymore. I'm tired of allowing this in. I need a miracle. And the pastor, being a loving pastor, said, let's pray. So the worship team came up, they said, and they began to worship, and they began to pray over this boy. And she said the miracle came after about 30 minutes of worship when the power of God swept in that room, sobered my boy up. He got saved. He got baptized in the Holy Spirit. And he is an Assemblies of God preacher in North Carolina while we're sitting in this room this morning because somebody said, i got to drag them to the house of God. It might be a neighbor. It might be a friend. It might be a family member. We said, God, here's, here, here's my, my neighbor, and he's got more hair than I do, and he's taller than I am, but I love him, God. I brought him to church. God, please anoint Pastor Gary. I don't want him to go to hell. I got him here today. God, touch his heart, change his life. We said, God, here's my friend, and I love him, God. He's an awesome young man, and I, I got my friend at church. God, please don't let him go to hell. Touch Pastor Gary. Anoint him. He's here, and I brought him today, God, and said, God, here's my dad, and I love you, Dad. I love you, Dad. And God, please don't let my dad, you need to shave. God, I got my dad to church, and I need him to come, God, and I brought him here. Please anoint the pastor. And one family member at a time, one friend at a time, one neighbor at a time, if we'll get them in here, how many believe the anointing will come on that man of God while he's preaching? And miracles will happen in this house that it's not about staying home with our property. It's not about staying home with our spouse. It's not about staying home with our cattle. It's about filling the house of God in obedience to what the King of Kings said. Is that right? No more excuses. Come on, say it. No more excuses. Come on, shout it. No more excuses. Would you give these guys a great big hand for helping us? Great job, guys. <laughs> Mr. Renee, can you come? I want you to know this as we pray. I want you to hear this. In this parable, the Bible says they lost their place. And God doesn't want you to lose your place today. But it could be so easy for us to let excuses to let a lack of expectation dominate our thinking. And I'm just telling you today, hear my heart, saints, to become the wrong example. Listen to me before I pray. The Bible tells us that they came running to Jesus and they said this. They said, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Is that what that says? Come on, help me. These are people, you can go ahead and begin to play, Miss Renee. These are people who knew God at one point. Hear my heart for just a minute. Didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out devils in your name? Didn't we minister in the house of the Lord? And what did Jesus say to them? Depart from me, for I never knew you. There are people in America that think because they prayed a prayer 30 years ago, they're okay. There are people in America today that think that because they went to a, a, a revival when they were a child, or they were sprinkled, or they were baptized when they were young, that they're okay. I want to tell you with all the love I can, we've got to look into our heart and say, God, have I allowed excuses to get in my way of believing that the great God of the universe can invade my circumstances? Have I let a lack of expectation that I'm expecting it? Every time the Alabama Crimson Tide plays football, I expect them to win. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Every... Have I let a lack of expectation come in me that I'm not expecting that God can touch me? And have I allowed the enemy 
to let me be one of those that just goes to church and 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 goes to church, but never engages with the God of the universe. See, the devil would love it if we just go to church but never impact anybody else with our faith. The devil would love it if we just go to church but never tell anybody else what God can do for them. Yes? He doesn't care how many songs we sing or how many services we attend as long as we just don't tell anybody else what God can do. And the Bible says that they looked at Jesus and said, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out devils in your name? And he said, depart from me. I never knew you. Today is a day I believe that God is saying, I want my power to come alive in you. Throw off the excuses. Throw off the excuses. Throw off the lack of expectation. And lift your voice and say, God, I believe you can touch me. I believe you can help me. I believe you can give me a new start. I believe you can give me a second chance. Today can be a day that you become the right example and not the wrong example. Every head bowed with you for just a moment. Would you bow your heads with me? Every head bowed all over this room, in the balcony, on the floor. If nobody's told you they love you today, let me tell you this, that Jesus loves you beyond anything that you understand. He's not mad at you. He doesn't hate you, but he loves you. But he loves you too much to leave you in that place. If you're here today, ask yourself this question. Ask yourself this question. Every person in this room, in the balcony, on the floor, God, if I died today, do I know that I know that I know that I'd be in heaven with you? It's a real question every human's going to have to answer. See, you can fool me today because I'm pretty easy to fool. You might fool pastor. You might fool your friends. You might fool your family. You might fool your spouse. You, you might even fool the police. But I can tell you this, you can't fool God. And he knows your heart. If you're a Christian, I need you to pray right now. I need you to intercede right now. Because somebody's life is in the balance that's in this room. The Bible promises a lot. It just doesn't promise tomorrow. The only thing we have is right now. You may never have a chance to hear a message like this again. What if today you were killed in a horrible automobile accident out here on 40, 431? What if a tornado came through this area that we have often in North Alabama and you were tragically killed because of a tornado that swept through this region? What, what, if, what if it was a drive-by shooting that's happening more and more and more in our nation with violence in our streets and you were tragically killed? Do you know that you know that you'd be in heaven with God? We all need to ask ourselves this question because we can fool the preacher. We can fool our friends. We can fool our neighbors. We can fool our family. We, we may even fool the law enforcement, but we can't fool God. And I need Christians, come on, pray. Holy Spirit, I've done everything you told me to do. Now I'm asking you to move across this room in the balcony on the floor and touch the hearts of every man, every woman, every boy, every girl in this place. And that, Lord, that you would draw them to your heart and that they would know what you can do in them. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Young lady, young man, mom or dad, guest here today, ask yourself this question. God, are you talking to me? If today was your last day, do you know that you know that you know that you'd be in heaven with God? If you're in this room and you say, you know what I've realized today while you've been preaching, I realize that there are things in my life that are wrong, that I'm not where I should be with God. I can fool everybody else, but I can't fool him. And I need to get closer to God today. Would you include me in that final prayer? I don't care who's on your right and left. I don't care who's in front of you and behind you. This is between you and the eternal God. And you're going to stand before Him one day, just like I will, whether we think we will or we won't. The Bible is very clear that we will stand before Him and our deeds will be made bare before Him. And there will be gold and silver and precious stone or wood, hay, and straw. It's going to happen just like God said. Are we ready for that? Now is the time to throw off the excuses before it's too late and say I need you Jesus I don't want to go to hell I can fool everybody else but I can't fool you God I need to get closer to you so if that's you young lady young man mom or dad guess here today and you say pastor I'm not where I should be with God there are things in my life that are wrong and I realize today I'm not prepared to go to heaven I need to get closer to Jesus maybe your fire has gone out maybe distance has come between you and God and if you're here and you say, you know what, I'm not, I, I, I'm not sure if I died, I would go to heaven, Pastor. Please include me in that final prayer. If that's you anywhere in this room, from the back row to the front and side to side in the balcony, if you say, Pastor, I, I realize today there's some things in my life that are wrong. And I can fool everybody else, but I can't fool God. I need to get closer to Jesus today. I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to miss God. Would you include me in that final prayer? No matter who's around you, Pete Christians pray. I need you to pray right now. If you're here under the sound of my voice, 
and you hear this right now and you say, Pastor, I know it's me. Don't be embarrassed by anybody around you. This is not between you and anybody else. You may never have another chance to hear a message like this. We're not asking you to join this church. We're asking you to join the kingdom of God. This is an amazing church. But we're asking you to join his kingdom. So with heads bowed and eyes closed, young lady, young man, mom or dad, if you say, Pastor, that's me. I'm not sure if I die today and go to heaven. My fire from him has grown colder. There's distance between me and God. And I realize I need to get closer to God today. Include me in that final prayer. I want to make sure that when he comes, I'm ready. If that's you anywhere in this room, when I count to three, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. Nobody's looking but God and me. And if that's you anywhere in this room, when I count to three, raise your hand right now. Shove it down the devil's throat. Don't let anything stop you. Here we go. One, two, three. That's me. That's me. Raise it now all over this room. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, I see you, honey. I see you, son. I see you, ma'am. I see you, ma'am. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You can put your hands down. Did you know the Bible says there's a party in heaven for you? That the angels in heaven rejoice over someone who comes close to Christ. I'm going to ask one more time. Pray, Christians. Maybe there's somebody else in this room that you should have raised your hand with these others. And you say, Pastor, I should have raised my hand, but I was embarrassed of what someone might think. Or I, I don't want anybody to know what's... This is not between you and anybody else. Everything on this earth is going to burn. It's only going to be, what did I do for Christ? If you're here and you didn't raise your hand a moment ago, but you know God's knocking on your heart's door, you say, I need to get closer to God today. Include me in that final prayer. If you didn't raise your hand a moment ago, I don't care how long you've been in this church or if you're a first-time guest, if you realize something is missing, you say, I need to get closer to God. I can fool everybody else, but I can't fool God. If you didn't raise your hand a moment ago, when I count to three, raise it right now. Shove it down the devil's throat. Here we go. One, two, three. I've been fighting for you, bro. I see you. I see you, sir. I see you, sir. Anybody else? I see you, sir. I see you, ma'am. Anybody else? Come on. Pray, church. The conviction of the Holy Spirit's just moving. He's just drawing people. Anybody else? Raise it now. Get my attention. Anyone else? That's me, pastor. Include me in that prayer. Hallelujah. You can put your hands down. The Bible says that party is for you in heaven, that the angels rejoice over you. Father, I'm asking now that you would do what I can't do. Touch their heart, change their life, and draw them into your eternal kingdom. That they will never excuse, have excuses again. And that, Lord, that every barrier will be moved. And they'll become the man and the woman of God you've called them to be today. Do your deep work, O oh God, we pray in Jesus' name. Would everybody stand with me? Nobody leaving for just a moment. Would everybody stand? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on. Nothing times nothing is. I'm believing right now. I'm going to ask every person in this room to turn and look at someone next to you and say, you know what? If you need to go get close to Jesus today, I'll go up there with you. Would you just turn and ask them right now? That question could eternally change someone's destiny. Just turn around and ask the people around you. Say, if you need to go get close to Jesus today, we can fool everybody else, but we can't fool God. Billy Graham was the first person I ever heard make that statement. We can fool everyone else, but we can't fool God. And you don't have to come by yourself. 39 years ago at Moffat Road Baptist Church in Mobile, Alabama, when the pastor said, come, and I walked to the front of that church and I gave my life to Jesus, nobody was laughing at me. They were giving me a standing ovation. And they were saying, there goes Johnny, there goes Johnny. And I want you to know nobody's going to laugh at you in here. Every person that raised their hand in the balcony or the floor, all the way to the back, they're already coming. If you raise your hand just a moment ago, I'm going to ask you to take the second bold step and come stand right here in this altar with me right now. Every person that raised their hand, you come right now. Here we go. One, two, three. Come on, would you give them a standing ovation, church? Come on, every one of them. Come on, every person that raised their hand, all the way to the back. Come on up here. Come on up here. Hallelujah. All the way to the back. Come on, I'm waiting back in the back. Come on, ladies. I'm waiting for you, sweetheart. Come on. I'm waiting for you. Come on. Will you clap till they all get here, church? Come on. The Bible says the angels in heaven rejoice. Hallelujah. 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 If you've got a friend or a family member up here, come stand with them. If you've got a friend or a family member, come stand with them right now. Hallelujah. And I'm going to ask everyone else right behind them, and everybody in the room, step out of your seat and come stand on this altar right now. Hallelujah. Don't ask you not to leave. I'm going to ask you to come right around this altar, and we're going to close with a time of prayer. We're expecting for heaven to do something in your life right now. We're expecting for heaven to invade this place. Those in the balcony, would you make your way down and come and stand? Everyone out of your seat if you can. If you have to sit, come sit on the front row. But I'm going to ask everybody to move in real close so we can pray with everyone. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, 
Hallelujah. Would you look at me, every person in this altar? I've been fighting for you since I came in today. And I sat by you on purpose. Because I'm telling you, you don't realize the greatness that is in you. And what God can do in you. You've had some people hurt you. But God will never hurt you. And he says, today is a day that you've given him this much. But he wants this much. And you give it to him, man of God. And there's nothing that can stop what God wants to do in your life. Man of God, when you raise your hand back there, it was like the glory of the Lord just came over you and said, I have something supernatural I want to do in his life. That today's a day to say, I'm selling out. I'm not going to give just a little. I'm going to give everything I have to the house of God. And God is going to use you, man of God. Look at me. God, the enemy has lied to you many, many times. And friends have lied to you many, many times. And that's why they've hurt you. But God will never hurt you. And he wants to wrap his love around you today, sweetheart. That you become the mighty woman of God. And it's hard for you to believe that God can do it with you. I want you to know you're beautiful, you're talented, you're gifted. And the enemies lie to you to tell you that you're worthless. And you'll never make it. You've heard those lies. But God says, I have greatness for you. And he wants to heal you today. And take that. Everything that's in your life. Let me tell you, man of God. Let me tell you, woman of God. That God says, I can change everything. Look at me. I was an alcoholic 39 years ago. My life was a mess. I'm the least of people. I don't deserve to be up here. But God changed my life just like He can change yours today. And He can wash it all over. And He can see you today like you've never failed. He can see you today like you never failed. That you get a new beginning. You get to start over. Look at me. And it's not about where you've been. It's about where you're going. And what God wants you to be, woman of God, that you start over today and say, I'm going to finish the song this time. You're going to finish, woman of God. Your, your pastor is going to help you, and you're going to finish the work. It's a new beginning. Let me tell you, it's a new beginning of what God says he has for you, that it's not behind you. It's hard for you to trust people, but trust the Lord. Trust him. Because of people that made promises to you that they didn't keep, it's hard for you to trust. Trust the Lord. And he says, I'll show you the way that I have for you, that it's a new beginning. It's a new beginning. It's a new beginning. And send God. Help me finish it. No more excuses. Would everybody bow your heads with me? We're going to pray a prayer today, woman of God. And we're going to believe that today God's going to wash something away. And you're going to walk out different. Would everybody stretch your hands toward these in the front? And would you, if you're close enough to them, would you just lay your hand on their shoulder? And would everyone pray this prayer out loud with me here at the family, uh, uh, here at Lake City, the, the church family. Would everyone pray this prayer out loud so nobody be embarrassed? Everyone pray it with me. Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross for me. I know it was my sins that nailed you on that cross. And I'm sorry, Lord. Please forgive me. I say with my mouth that Jesus is the Christ. And I believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. I give you my past, all of my mistakes, all of my hurt, all of my pain, all of my sin. I give you my future, everything I will ever become, and I start over today, and I receive you now as my only Lord, as my only hope, as my only way to heaven. Live in me now. No more excuses. I want your house for the rest of my days in Jesus' name. Now stretch your hands toward Him and ask God to do this. Lord, break every word curse. Break every soul tie. Break every generational curse. Break every genetic curse. Loose them, powers of hell. Loose them, powers of hell. They are no longer the property of their past. They are no longer the property of their mistakes. They are no longer the property of what they were before they came in here today. They are now sons of God, daughters of God, with a new beginning to be what you have called them to be. And Lord, let them run this race with no more excuses, but being what you've called them to be in Jesus' name. We believe you for it today, Almighty God, in Jesus' name. Can we give these that just prayed that prayer a standing ovation? Come on, church. Can we rejoice? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
Everything can change. When I prayed this prayer, I'm coming back to you, man of God. When I prayed this prayer 39 years ago, everything changed. I didn't want to drink anymore. I didn't want to party anymore. I just wanted to be with God. Everything changed. I'm telling you, woman of God, that when you give him everything, pastor said it at the beginning, he gives you everything. And he, you've had a lot stolen from you. You've had a lot stolen from you. But here's a, we serve a God who can give it back. We serve a God who can command. Job had it all stolen, but God gave it back to him twice as much. Is that right, church? Is that right? And God can do it for each of us in this room. Starting from that young lady over there to Brother Pastor Seth to Brother Whitebeard right there. Hold your hand up. Hallelujah. All the way over here to the sister with the black hair and Brother Royal Ranger and Sister Ponytail. Every one of us in this room, he wants to wash us today. Amen. Can you lift your hands with me and can you make this faith declaration? Come on, say it with me. Say, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. I choose today. I choose today. To break my covenant. To break my covenant. With every excuse. With every excuse. That's in my life. That's in my life. Pull it out. Pull it out. Break it. Break it. Remove it from remove me. Remove it from me. I willingly. I willingly. Throw it off. Throw it off. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Now, come on. Can we believe God for that? Can we believe God? Here's what I want to challenge you to do. I want to challenge you to do this. I want to challenge you to do three things, all right, before we leave this place and we get ready for our drama tonight. Number one, I want to challenge you to get baptized in water. Obviously, it didn't work the first time. Let's do it again. It didn't work for me the first time. I didn't understand that I was dying in water to come up in resurrection life, that I identify with him for the rest of my days. Pastor will baptize you. I want to encourage you. Be baptized in water, even if you've been baptized in water before. And pastor will help you do that. The second thing that I want to challenge you to do is go home and have a house cleaning. If there's anything that stands between you and God, get it out of your house. Burn it, bury it, trash it, throw it away. If it's on your computer, if it's in your house, trash it. Get rid of it because it's hindering you. Flush it, pour it out, whatever you got to do. The third thing to do that I want to challenge you to do is if you're in a relationship that's not a godly relationship... The pastors here will counsel you with that. And they'll show you how to walk through that with integrity and walk out the faith that God's given you. Hallelujah. Pastor, you come and you're going to tell them what to do with Amen. that. And then I've Amen. got one more thing I'm going to share Amen. with them. Praise God. Listen, if, if you've never received one of these, you've made a commitment to the Lord. And uh, this is a little book, Now What? Now that I've made a commitment to the Lord. Now, some of you, I know you. And I know you've been in church a while. and you Just stay right here with but us But listen, the this right here is just a few little, little chapters that says, how can I pray effectively? How can I study God's Word? How can I be a strong Christian? This is a helpful booklet I want every one of you to have that made a commitment to the Lord today. And listen, we want to support you. You need people in your life that are going to encourage you to walk with Jesus, okay? And so we, we would love to get, if, you're, if we don't have your personal information, a phone number, an email address, something like that where we can contact you and encourage you, please give us that today. We've got these little cards here and, and uh, we can pass those out. And listen, we're family. And, and nobody was created to walk this walk alone. That's why he talked about being in the house of God. It's not that, they're, that you know, just because you're in the house of God, you're a Christian. No, here's what it is. We need each other. Amen? We need encouragement. We need support. Sometimes we need somebody to sharpen us and say, hey, man, that's just an excuse. Sometimes, right? Sometimes we need that. And so I, I really... We want to connect with you. And, and listen, we want to be your friend in the faith because we all need one. Amen? Praise God. Praise God. I tell you what I want to do. I want to pray for these people briefly that have made a move toward the Lord. I know some of these people have asked Jesus into their heart before today, but they obviously feel a need to draw closer. Let's pray for them. Father, we just pray. We pray over them. And we ask you, confirm, strengthen, establish them in their faith. Lord, speak to their heart clearly. Open your word to their understanding. Let them sense your presence. Let them dare believe that their sins are washed away, that they are in relationship with you by the Spirit. And Lord, that you will walk with them, never leave them nor forsake them. And God, you hear their cry. 
I pray you would confirm those things in their heart today. And Lord, knit them to this body of people that can nurture them in Jesus' name. In Jesus. Can you say amen? In Jesus' name. Amen. Now Young listen. Man, come here. Oh, you, no, 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 you go ahead. Go ahead. Young man right there, come here again for me. All right. You're going to forget a lot of things that were said today. But I don't want you to forget this. Okay. Would you bend over my shoulder just once more? You see, I got one a little skinnier this time. All right. How many of you know somebody who's not a Christian? Hold your hand up. I'm going to ask you to get a ticket and get them here tonight. There's nothing more important, and we can offer them life tonight. And this drama is going to give them life. So go call somebody, invite somebody, and get them here tonight. How many of you got a friend? Hold your hand up. Uh, somebody, take the tickets give them out and and we need every person back here tonight we were in birmingham just a couple of weeks ago and we had 300 people show up for the sunday night drama can you believe 53 people got saved can you believe with me can you believe with me come on throw your hands up and say come on no more excuses i'm gonna get no them i'm gonna get them lord we just believe tonight in jesus name that you're gonna help us to fulfill this and that, Lord, we throw every excuse off. Come on, say it. I throw every excuse throw off. every excuse off. Do it, Lord, and help us to do this in your name. Amen. Amen. Come on, Amen. give the Lord a shout Amen. of praise. Hallelujah. Listen, if, if you've decided in your heart you want to support Brother Johnny's ministry financially, there's going to be an usher at each door with a bag. No compulsion, no, you know, it, but if you just feel like God speaks to your heart, they're there if you want to give, okay? See you tonight. God bless you.